it's endless. And so it was essential that the character got away with it. You know, the, the nice guys finished last and the demons going to run the world. What was um, the Hunter S. Thompson quote? Yeah. He, he said, you know, the music industry is a place where thieves and pimps run free and good men die like dogs. There is also a negative side. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Thanks, it was Pete. good. It was important to stay true to that. And uh, so now we're developing the script in a lot of meetings. And it was initially going to be um, a, 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 a film four project in the UK, Channel Four. And... Uh, but now it's, the book's just come out in America and it's turned out it's, it, Jay-Z and Beyonce are enormous fans of the book. <laughs> so now we've got a situation where Jay-Z is looking to write the theme tune. and So uh, 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 suddenly I can just see it becoming this... It's become a caricature f- as well, a novelist. I imagine Jay-Z is going to be on board as a producer soon. It's going to be I'm rewriting this for a black stale fox. So it would be interesting. But um, the way it came about was hysterical. So a, f- a f- friend of a friend was making a documentary about Jay-Z and was filming Beyonce in the back of a limo and she goes, we didn't kill your friends. And the guy goes, you, 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 that your kind of thing? She goes, oh, I love this shit. <laughs> Jay gave it to me. He's like, so um, it's, uh, we'll see, I'll keep you posted on that one. It's going to be an interesting few months. I'm sure, I'm sure there's many questions. I think before we move to questions, um, John should read a bit of the book. Would that be a good idea? Yeah. Well, I thought... I, I'm going to read. It's a lesson to us all. No, no, fuck off. <laughs> I'm going to. I'm going to read. Just don't worry. It's very short, three, four pages. Um, but this is sort of at the Miami Winter Music Conference, which is why we're here, by the way. Which, why we, this is apparently why we wanted to start the IMS. And I thought it'd be interesting to compare and contrast that convention in time with kind of what we're at now. Uh, to set the scene for you, um, they're all over there and they've basically got out their minds in the plane and are now in the process of not leaving the hotel for the entire duration of the conference. The, the, <laughs> the, uh, you'll get the idea. <laughs> Maybe we should go out, someone says. Oh, that would be bad, someone else says. It might be me. It's hard to tell who's saying what because all our voices are the same now. All cracked, ghosted whispers, static crackling across the room. Fragments of several different conversations ricochet around, overlapping, out of sync, at cross purposes. We'll need more coke soon. The guy's bringing it. That black guy. Oh, fuck. Go in the bathroom. We need more fucking booze. I need a whiskey. Have you heard that Stardust bootleg? I can't face him. Get room service to fill the minibar again. Hide in the fucking bathroom. Fucking tune, mate. Oh, God. I can't face room service. I think I'm having a heart attack. Hide in the bathroom, you cunt. I think we should go out. Fuck off. Right, you cunts. I'm calling room service. Lemington says this. We've been in Miami for 36 hours now, and I have yet to leave this room. I move across the darkened, fetid suite. We're in the hotel where they filmed some of Goldfinger, as someone uselessly points out every five minutes. I look out the window and very nervously pull the curtains a couple of millimetres apart. A thin band of intense, toxic sunshine lasers across the room. And just for a second, I glance sky, green palms, and beyond them, the beach and the ocean, before everyone is screaming for me to shut the fucking curtains. <laughs> just checking, I say. It is around 30 degrees outside, but we have the windows sealed and the aircon on full crank. Through the open window, 10 floors below, you can hear the roar of chattering delegates intercut with splashes as people dive into the pool. I walk around the room, swinging my arms, kicking my legs, my chin tucked tightly into my chest. I'm beyond wired, pure current. I think if I did a couple of pills, I could go out, someone says. That's not totally crazy, someone else replies. Fat boy slim tonight, someone else says. Ronnie sighs. Where? At the cameo? Fuck that. We have to go out tonight. Sighs at the cameo? Maybe we should get some hookers in. No, fat boy. He's at the Delano. Strippers anyway. Do you mean where he's staying or where he's playing? Eh? We started on the Chang somewhere over Ireland. When we landed, having raped the virgin upper-class bar for 10 hours straight, we were met by this dealer someone knew. We got a limo and continued with the Chang on the drive into town. I don't know everyone in the room. There's some guy from an indie label, XL, Moax, Rising High, who knows? And a publisher kid, Warner Chapel, BMG, and a couple of expat Brits, drug dealer types who somehow vaguely attached themselves to us. Darren hasn't spoken for five or six hours. He just sits there, rocking back and forth. At one point, I made an attempt to go downstairs and actually register at the convention to pick up my delegate pass so I could attend the showcases and discussion panels where Gak and Pill lobotomized fools will ruminate on worthy topics like 
um, is the super club killing club culture and how will internet DJing affect the economies of former Soviet bloc countries? <laughs> now, strike all of you. The, the left doors opened, and way across the lobby, I could see some of the Brit contingent, Dave Beer, Chris Needs, people like that. I glimpsed a sober business-like Parker Hall striding up to reception. I tell you, I pressed the button for our floor and ran back to the fucking room. You don't want to go down there, I told everyone. That was, I think, sometime yesterday afternoon. The whole world now looks like an abstraction, a dream you had when you were a kid. Intangible, a few blood images, the faintest tang of an aftertaste. Richie Houghton, someone says. Dimitri from Paris, get the yellow pages. He shit his pants in Central Fly. More coke. Peanut Butter Wolf, Todd Terry, Carol Cox, Basement Jacks. I think someone is crying. It might be me. Groove Rider, a case of fucking crystal. Maybe some sushi. Richie Houghton, double ended her, propeller heads. There's a fierce copper style rap at the door. Oh, fuck. Jesus, fuck. Who's that? Who is it? Someone asks in a whisper. It's room service, you clown, says Lemonting. Oh, incredibly the only person seemingly in control as he heads for the door. Fuck that. You're kidding, aren't I? I say. Three or four of us huddle furniture, elbowing each other out of the way as we scramble into the bathroom. We bolt the door and crouch down in the milky plastic light. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Someone keeps saying, it'll be all right. It'll be okay, someone else says soothingly. Is this your first time in Miami? Some bloke whispers to me. I shake my head. I'm off my nut, but I'm vaguely aware that this isn't a reasonable way to earn a living. <laughs> a long time passes. You can hear everyone's heart beating, the tap drips. There's a knock on the door and Leamington's voice, they all clear. We open the door and creep out. Christ. A black waiter, a young guy, tall, thin, is standing in the middle of the suite, unloading cocktails from a tray onto the coffee table. He turns and sees us, emerging from the bathroom. We all freeze. Have you got the coke? One of the bathroom idiots <laughs> says to the waiter. <laughs> Just seeing a black guy and mistaking him for the dealer, despite the tray, his black and purple tunic, the gold name tag on his chest, and the fact that he's clearly a fucking waiter. I'm sorry, I say, I'm so sorry. The kid takes his tray and the proffered $20 tip and fucks off out of it, looking properly scared. You cunt, I say to Leamington, who's laughing his head off. Oh, God, we're finished now, Darren says. Have a drink, Leamington says. Don't you understand? It's over. Darren is actually becoming hysterical. He's going to go back downstairs and he's going to tell them what we're doing and they're going to come up here and they're going to come out. Shut up and have a fucking cocktail, you twat. Here, have a cosmopolitan. Leamington hands Darren a gigantic martini glass full of what looks like thin, pale blood. He seems to have ordered every cocktail on the menu. Do we have any fucking pills, I ask. Yeah, someone says. Maybe we should switch rooms. Maybe if we take the pills, we can go out. Have you heard that Stardust bootleg, someone asks. Here, someone presses an E into my hand and I suck it back with a gulp of tequila sunrise. Hey, do you know they filmed Goldfinger here? Leamington says, still laughing. Thank you. And then people used to say no one got any work done in Miami. <laughs> which is why we're here. <laughs> um, any questions for John Niven? <laughs> Mark. In the break, I appointed uh, this gentleman as my lawyer. <laughs> and I just want to say that... Uh, I'm deeply insulted, personally wounded, that all I get is a passing reference to one of your characters speaking to the bloke who ran Island Records. Uh, I didn't even get a fucking name check. <laughs> well, uh, duly noted in future editions okay. of the book Thank will be... You. Excellent. You want the full job title? Full job it? title. Um, but there was, there's some really important stuff in the book, actually, that is deadly serious. There's a, there's a page which I love and I refer to and I show to new bands that I'm working with, which is that list of 67. I counted them. That's how much wow. how seriously I took it. <laughs> I thought artists, it was 70. But... Artists that we signed in that, as an industry in that one year mm. and how many of them actually popped through and broke I'm through. There's three of them. Mm. Three of them out of 67. What a fucking wasted time that was. And two or three <laughs> of them I signed, or my company signed at the time, and, uh, you know, mea culpa, I feel responsible for it. And what a time it was. Great book. Thank you I very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any oh. other questions? Yeah. We got a live one. Hi. 
Uh, do you think this book is of any uh, relevance to people outside of music business? Well, it's a, it's a valid question. Uh, initially, I thought that maybe we'd, s we'd sell a few thousand to people in the business. Um, but it's broken me over uh, about 100,000 books worldwide now. So it's kind of... I think anyone who works in one of those horrible alpha male boiler house environments, whether it's the city or advertising or movies or music, they recognise that culture where it's, you know... As he says in the book, it's not dog eat dog, it's dog gang rapes dog, tortures them for five days and then kills everyone the dog's <laughs> ever known. So anybody who works in that sort of world, I think, gets it, you know? So it, we're, we're beyond that now. People are definitely who don't work in the business are getting it, you know? Uh, Simon Napier Bell wrote the book uh, "You Don't Have to Say You Love Me," mm. which is um, depicting some of these scenes in the 60s in London. And he states in that book that he only used his sexual interest as his barometer or compass for anything he signed or, or moved on through his entire career. Mm -hmm. And it never failed him once and <laughs> laid ground to some fantastic Failed sign. me many times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he would hold up that without all this um, filth, mm. um, you ain't gonna get the industry swinging. Mm. That's well, his point. Well, I mean, this is, with one of the bands in the book, Songbirds, who are a sort of fictional amalgam of bit of the Sugar Babes, a bit of All Saints, one of those manufactured girl groups. The character actually says in the book, they're awful, they're appalling. There's nothing good about this band. Apart from the fact that I'd quite like to do a couple of them. <laughs> That's his criterion for signing them. And that may sound insane to a lot of people, but the industry turns in such hunches. I remember seeing Dave Balfe not long after he signed Blur. And he was just, he went, they were called Seymour then. He went, I've signed this fucking band, Seymour. Jesus, they're a pile of shit. And I went, why did you sign them? <laughs> And he went, well, it's just something about the singer. That was it. That was the extent of the hunch. It was just something about Damon Albarn that you could see even then that was worth a gamble, you know? And often the industry... I'm not saying that David Balfe was trying to do Damon Albarn, by the way. <laughs> I realised potentially. <laughs> but um, it often does... But it's predicated, you know, it's the kind of business that's predicated on hunches and, you know, Ertigan said, you know, as rare as the ability, as rare as talent itself is the ability to spot talent, especially when talent is embryonic and it's not fully realised. It's very, you know, it's the alchemy business. It's, a, you know, as Mark was saying there, 70 bands and three got away. Now, that was also a testament to time of colossal waste and overspending. But even when the industry's doing well, you'd be very, you'd do very well if your hit rate's a couple out of ten, you know. You're a big fan of a and at the moment. You're talking about the need for filters. Yeah. I, I, the, now, I mean, I'm an old man now, so the, the, one of the things that I find strange about the internet world, apart from the fact that nobody seems to give a shit about their own personal space, and, you know, here's my birthday party, all the photographs from at my home address. Please have this world, which I can't quite get my head around. Um, it, it's now a place where... Everyone thinks they're a star. Everyone's got their website. Everybody's music's up there. Everybody's writing their own, to, you know, everybody's sort of saying, my thoughts are worth something. No, they're not. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> and you need good A&R men like good editors at magazines or filters, you know. You, you, get, you, you find the good stuff for people, you know, because there's, there's a lot of people singing in the shower to that Wigfield song thinking, I deserve my 15 minutes. Any other questions? Jonesy is staying quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> Did you have to take anything out? Um, actually, no. Oh, that's interesting. Good. Not in England, but I, I went, like, the book's also, and strangely and worryingly, pretty big in Germany, I have to say. So I was in a reading tour in Germany, and what happens in Germany is I'll sit and read a bit from the book in English, because everybody speaks good English, and then uh, a German musician was reading the book in German, you know, so the two of us up there doing it. And the editor there had said, I'd said to him, we got the other, we did four or five nights in different cities, and in Berlin he said, um, I said to the editor, what, what part do you want to read? And he said, oh, I think we should read the Glastonbury section. I thought, okay, and I think that's bad. I said, why is that bad? That's bad in Germany. I thought, oh my God. It's a bit where they arrive at Glastonbury Festival, and the, you know the banner over the entrance to the festival says, you know, Glastonbury Greenpeace Festival. And when the guy cracks the gag, says that it should say Arbeit macht frei, which is, of course, what it said over the gates to Auschwitz. So I'm sort of thinking, we cannot read that. 
And anyway, the guy's reading it in German, and suddenly I noticed he's just not uh, he's not read that bit. And I thought, God, did they, um, did he pass over that? Did he sense that it's a bad thing, or, or is it not in the book? So I've got a little bit of German I'm flicking through, but I thought they've taken it out. So Stell Fox in the book is very fond of his sort of Nazi slash Holocaust metaphors for everything. So I've really they've just taken all that stuff out. And I thought, fine, you know, it's a bit like licensing a track. Once somebody buys it for their country, they can do what they like, you know, to make it work in their market. But the, the, the German musician guy was really angry in my part that I had been censored like this. And, uh, but the publisher, he said, in Germany, there's certain things we just still can't talk about. He said, if we'd sent the book out with that and all the press, everything would just have been about that. You know, we couldn't have got past it. So, um, fair enough. <laughs> but and not in the English one, the, you know, and all the other countries. I think we've sold the book now to... America, Holland, Spain, Italy, Germany, and that was the only instance of sort of editorial censorship. Love the, love the book and uh, taking the decision to recommend it to my friends rather than kill them. <laughs> but I just wondered, have you ever killed anyone? <laughs> Actually, I got asked this in America. In America the, the book just came out in America, and I got I was doing this t t sort of... Um, EPK thing out there and the girl went, so Jan, have you ever killed any of your friends? <laughs> no. <laughs> I've been solely fucking tempted. <laughs> but no. I'm just a bit curious from you guys. Um, I was brought up in the industry with the term rock and roll, which uh, obviously what you just read, what you just read, kind of uh, is a great example. Do you think the industry is going to sort of suffer that as we're going through these changing times, I mean, there are certain artists that are still quite rock and roll, Amy Winehouse being one of them. But um, I personally love that whole era. I know things have changed, but do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing in terms of creating great artists in the next 10 years? Uh, I think I'm not in a position, I'm a, as I said, I'm a fat, middle-aged man now, so I don't really know where it's at. Nowadays, but I, I know what I'm really bored of these the music industry's over, the dance music's over. You know, fuck off. No, it's not. You know, there's still kids, I'm sure, everywhere around the world with really exciting bands putting on great club nights, starting great labels. You know, music is elemental, it's as primitive as fire lighting and fucking. It's not going to go away. There's always going to be a need to for bright people to you know channel it and if sign you, if it. You so were, if you were an artist, who, what type of labels would you sign to, or who would you be looking to sign to? Uh, if mm -hmm. I were an artist, oh, it's funny now because I kind of am in the, I'm now being the writer and signing to Random House. I am in the position, obviously, Wall of Sound, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I am in the position of being the artist, and it's really funny signing contracts now, and I'm signing book publishing contracts where I'm f giving away my electronic rights for not P, and I'm literally getting the same raping I did to artists for <laughs> thinking sweet poetic justice in a way. <laughs> but um, it's funny because the, the book publishing industry is very gentlemanly and it's a bit slower than music and it's behind it. And uh, Christian Tartlesfield, a friend of ours who's an a &R guy at Warners, had happened to have a drink with my editor from Random House recently and, and myself. And um, the, <laughs> the guy from Christian was saying to him, do you think the electronic book, the e-reader, is going to affect your business much? And he was going... He's going, no, I think, you know, people at the end of the day are going to want the physical object of the book in their hand. And then <laughs> Christian went, yeah, we seem to have a few of those conversations a few years ago. And then I woke up and I seemed to be starring in some horrible version of The Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> Plugged into some fucking electronic world where everybody's taking your shit for nothing. And uh, the guy was trying to, from a publisher was trying to say, oh, I don't know if it'll be like that for us. And Christian said, well, you know, mate, at the end of the day, free is a pretty big fucking incentive <laughs> for anyone. So, you know, I think the problem with it, it won't hit book publishing just yet in that um, the, Steve Jobs hasn't come up with a super sexy e-reader yet, the equivalent of the iPhone or the iPod. Once they crack that and they make the really sexy piece of hardware to, to read it on, then I think we'll be in trouble, you know? And I've just signed away all the rights for all that. <laughs> Fuck! But, I mean, I don't like reading on a screen like that. I couldn't do it, because I'm a generation that can't cope with that. But my son, who's 13, he'll quite happily sit there and read page after, you know, so it's a, it's a user thing that a generation below us, I don't think of the problems we do. So that'll be interesting in 10 years' time. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you, Pete. It's fantastic. Thank you.